Welcome, family of God, to another teaching installment of When the Temple in Heaven is Open, Everything Will Change. Get ready to dive deep into God's holy word as we discover his gems and jewels, where the Bible tells us it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search it out, as we see how God declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying his counsel shall stand and he will do all of his good pleasure. The Holy Spirit has a treat for us today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. John chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep, did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, gracious Heavenly Father, for this is the day that you have made. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Because you are worthy of it all. You have saved all who call upon your name by your precious blood. For you are able to save unto the uttermost those who come to you by faith and so we thank you lord that you have given us a measure of faith to respond to your calling of come and here we are seated in heavenly places in christ jesus our lord because you first loved us and because you first loved us we we love you lord oh lord even when we are faithless you remain faithful for you cannot deny yourself and so we thank you lord for the predestination we thank you, Lord, for having our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We thank you, Lord, for being that solid foundation upon which we can build our faith. For no other foundation can any person lay except that which has been laid, which is you, Jesus Christ. For you are the door. Hallelujah. You are the door, O oh Lord, and if we enter in through you, you have promised us that we shall be saved. And we will go in and out and find pasture. And so, Lord, you have set before us an open door, according to Revelation chapter 3, to the church of Philadelphia, that only you can open. And, Lord, we know in Revelation chapter 4 that the door will open. And because your word has promised that you will come again and receive us to yourself so that where you are, we will be too. We know, O oh Lord, according to what you told us in John chapter 10, verse 9, that if we enter in when the door opens in Revelation chapter 4, O oh Lord, we're saved. Hallelujah. Because we are your sheep. Hallelujah. And because we are your sheep, we follow you because we know your voice. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you are the word of God made flesh and you have given us life and life more abundantly oh lord how we love you we pray holy spirit that 
you would teach us great and mighty things which we do not know. May you open up our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word. May you open up these types and these shadows so that we can see your masterful game plan declared at the beginning where you have shown us the end. So Holy Spirit, take the things of Christ and make them real to us. May our minds be stayed on you so that you could keep us in perfect peace. I pray for the anointing to overflow with the seven spirits of God because the principal thing is wisdom. Therefore, we must get wisdom. And with all of our getting, may we get understanding. Oh, speak knowledge right now, Lord, as the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might and the spirit of yod heh vav and the spirit of the fear of yod heh vav -Heh dwells in us richly. For the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. O oh Lord, may we walk down this narrow path filled with the Holy Ghost, giving praise unto your name as we declare your truth to whosoever will. O oh Lord, may you quicken us. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In the matchless, self-sacrificing name, the name that is above all names, Jesus the Messiah, we pray and ask it all. Amen. Well, hallelujah, saints of God. It's so good to be back with another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is open. Everything will change, and I just have to rejoice in the Lord at all times. Child of God, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. You see, it's so amazing when you put on your scuba gear, right? You put on your scuba gear and you put on uh, your, your diving equipment, right? The full armor of God. And, and you start to dig as you would dig for hidden treasure when you go into the word of God. And you start to go on a diamond search. <laughs> and as you go on a diamond search, as you go to and fro through the scriptures, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. It's amazing that you also discover other gems and jewels along the way. Hallelujah. You see some pearls over there. You see some gold over there. You see some rubies over there. Uh, you see some emeralds over there. Right. You see all these precious jewels when you had your mind focused on the diamond. <laughs> you see, but that's the thing with God. Amen. His treasure trove, which is the word of God, is filled with endless riches. Mm. Right. His treasure trove in the word of God is filled with endless riches that he says it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. Ooh -wee. But it's the honor of kings to search it out. You see, that's why God tells us to be diligent. Mm. Right. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that he exists. Amen. And that he is a rewarder. God is a rewarder. Amen. And he is a rewarder of all. That means you, child of God, if you know him, if you have faith, who what? Diligently seek him. You see, it's like that age old analogy, right? You know, a miner, they're not going to find uh, no gold on the surface of the earth. They're not going to find no diamonds on the surface of the earth, right? They're not going to find those jewels and gems on the surface of the earth. No, it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some diligence. It's going to take uh, some work, right? Some labor. Hallelujah. It's going to take uh, some effort. Hallelujah. To extract as they go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the earth, those minerals, those jewels, those gems. Same thing with an oil rig. The oil's not on the surface of the earth. You, you got to put a drill and you got to dig down deep, right? If you want to hit that black gold, right? So it's going to take effort. It's going to take work, right? And the work that we do is what? Belief, right? This is the work of God that you believe on the one whom he has sent. And so how do we strengthen our belief, right? Well, we get to know who he is by studying his word that he has given us, right? And so because we search for God, hallelujah, because we draw near to God, hallelujah, because we have been invited to come close to God, hallelujah, because he has made a new and living way. Amen. Our desire is him. Right. And because our desire is him. We go to where his story is located at 
to get to know him. Amen. And so that's the whole point. You see, I was on a journey getting these diamonds about the priesthood. Mm. And there's so many diamonds, hallelujah, about this priesthood. But along my journey uh, of this uh, deep sea dive into the word of God, God showed me a couple nuggets that I want to highlight today so that I could continue to encourage the body of Christ with the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture. You see, <clears throat> I can't say it enough because, I mean, this is what God says. Hallelujah. This, this is exactly what God says. You see, you see, God is so good. Amen. <laughs> God is so good that not only does he overtly speak about the pre-tribulation rapture, right? I mean, he, he, he puts it right there in our face. There's, there's no denying it. I mean, we could just go to so many different places to see it overtly, right? We go to the, the number one text, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, right? It's right there in your face, pre-tribulation rapture. We could, we could go uh, to Matthew 24, right? He, we could go to Revelation chapter four. We we could see we could see the pre tribulation rapture right in our face, right? Because God is good; He doesn't want anybody to miss it. But because this event is so pivotal, Hallelujah! Because this event is so spectacular, Hallelujah! Because this event is the glory of God, Hallelujah! God has told us about this event repeatedly. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. It's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. You see, but the only way that you could understand his word is to get into his word. You see, a lot of people, they don't want to get into his word. No wonder they don't understand the pre-tribulation rapture, right? They think they know it all, right? They think they have God figured out, right? And so they want to deny him his glory, which is a sad state to be in, right? They want to deny him his glory, thinking that they have it all figured out when they don't know nothing, okay? You talk about, you see, when you hear people talking about there's no pre-tribulation rapture, now you can off the top tell right away that they're ignorant, right? They're, they're ignorant of the things of God, amen, right? Because they're speaking words without knowledge, and knowledge comes from God. OK, so to be so ignorant, yet so puffed up at the same time saying, hey, there's no pre-tribulation rapture. The church is going to be here during the time of Jacob's trouble. Off top, when I hear that, oh, well, you lack understanding. Mm, right? You're ignorant. Right? You don't have any knowledge. Right? You haven't been spending time with him to understand his game plan in regards to eschatology. It's evident by the words that are coming out your mouth. Right? Because anybody who's a serious Bible student. Right who has the Holy Spirit teaching them, mm, that's the key, the Holy Spirit has to be your teacher. Right? You can't teach yourself, the Holy Spirit has to teach you, the Holy Spirit has to teach me, the Holy Spirit is the one who has to take the things of Christ and make them real to us. He has been our guide even unto death, hallelujah. He is with us even till the end of the age, he is our seal unto the day of redemption, he is the comforter, right? And he is the one who has to lead us and guide us into all truth. So when we depend on him, the Holy Spirit, who is God in us, when we depend on him to teach us as a little child, right? As a little child who listens to Abba, right? As a little child is humble before daddy, right? As a little child who comes to our king, and say, Lord, teach me great and mighty things which I do not know. Well, God's not going to play hide and go seek if you're his child, mm, right? He's not playing hide and go seek. He's not playing games, right? He's not, he's not playing, you know, uh, you know, he's not playing these games, right? He wants us to know. Hallelujah. See, but the question is, do you want to know? Mm. A lot of people don't want to know, right? A lot of people don't want to know. But for us in the body of Christ who have this understanding, it is our job, hallelujah, in the body of Christ, hallelujah, to teach, to preach, right, to exhort, to rebuke, to reprove, right, to encourage, right, to build up, to lift up, to speak the truth in love, to have our speech filled with grace, seasoned with salt, right, 
It is our job to be his mouthpiece as his hands and feet carrying the good news of Jesus Christ, especially to build up the household of faith with the word of life. And so that's why we have to continue. Amen. Continue to speak this truth because it's all about to happen. You see, this is the whole thing. Then we're going to get to the teaching. Amen. This is the whole thing, child of God. The pre-tribulation rapture, which is spoken about from Genesis to Revelation, literally, right, is so monumental. It's just so monumental. The more, the more that, you know, God continues to reveal to me about how important this event is, it just continues to, fa to, 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 to flabbergast me, right? It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's absolutely, it's, it's like words that not even come into my mind to even communicate how monumental this event is. This is absolutely monumental. It's, it's absolutely monumental. This event that we're all going to be a part of if you have the Holy Spirit. This event that we're all going to be a part of, even if you don't have the Holy Spirit, because you're going to be under God's feet. This rapture event, which is no secret, no secret. Oh, no. No such thing as no secret rapture. Okay, the, Get that out your mind as well. Ain't no such thing as no secret rapture. Right. The rapture is a rescue from the most devastating. I'm talking about devastation. OK, you're going to see it in, as we go through this type and shadow. The rapture is a rescue. It's a snatching away, a harpazo. Okay, the seas with force, right? In the twinkling of an eye, right? The rapture event is a rescue from the most devastating. I'm talking about devastation, okay? Devastation. The rapture is a rescue from the most devastating. Mm. Introduction of God in all of human history. Mm. And this is the whole point. This is what we're going to see. This is what we're going to see because God is going to show this to us, right? as he declares the end from the beginning. You see, the whole point of the rapture is for those of us who know him, we're going to go into his house because the door is going to open. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ says in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. So in Revelation chapter 4, when the door opens, <laughs> if we're caught up in the clouds, when Jesus Christ descends in the air upon the clouds as the son of man, at his revelation as the son of man with the golden crown on his head and the sharp sickle in his hand. At that time, if you know his voice, hallelujah, he's going to lead us out. right? And we're going to be saved because he's going to bring us through the door into his house. Hallelujah. Nothing secret about that event. You see, because if you're not in the number, right? if you're not in the number on that day, right, when the table of showbread and the menorah are put into his house. If you're not in that number, right, it's absolute devastation on the planet. It's absolute devastation, right? God says he's going to come like lightning from east to west, right? He's the line of the tribe of Judah. No one comes unto the Father unless we go through the Son, right? Jesus Christ is the line of the tribe of Judah. That's the standard uh, on the east. That's where Judah was camped at in the tabernacle model. He comes like lightning from east to west. There's only one way into the house. You have to go east to west. And at the west end is uh, the ox, the calf, also known as the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph. Right? Who is the father? He's the one on the throne. Right? No one comes unto the father unless we go through the son. When he comes like lightning from east to west, everybody who's found in him not having our own righteousness, but the righteousness which only comes by faith in Jesus Christ, table of showbread, menorah, all of us who are gathered up in the glory cloud, right? When Jesus Christ, the son of man, is revealed on the clouds, Daniel chapter 7 says that the son of man comes before the ancient of days in the clouds of heaven. If you're not in that number, when the saints go marching in, well, God says wherever the caucus is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Mm. Right? You see, <clears throat> again, and we're going to go through this, Lord willing, because I, we're going to get to this priesthood. But everything revolves around knowing who God is. Right? You have to know Jesus Christ. And the more you get to know Jesus Christ through your diligent study of him, the more you will realize how every jot and tittle will be fulfilled. That's why he says specifically that nothing, <laughs> right, 
no jot, no tittle will ever fall from the law, will ever pass from the law until all things are fulfilled, right? And so everything that we see, right, as we study to show ourselves approved in the word of God, will be fulfilled to the T. And so when we understand God's models, such as this that you're looking at right here, specifically this tabernacle model, everything makes sense, right? Everything makes sense when you understand the tabernacle model because this tabernacle model, hallelujah, is used repeatedly in the New Testament. It's everywhere, right? Because even in the New Testament, the writer to the Hebrews tells us that it was a copy, right? It was a shadow, right, of the good things to come, mm. right? That's why God instructed Moses on Mount Sinai to make sure that he made everything according to the pattern that was shown him, right? So if it's a model, if it's a pattern, that means that there's a heavenly reality of the earthly tabernacle, which is, of course, heaven itself where God sits. Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. So we already know what the Ark of the Covenant is. Now we have to unravel what the table of showbread, the menorah, and the altar of incense is because when these three items are mentioned in the book of Revelation, according to the pattern given to Moses on the mountain that God told him to make sure he made everything according to it, after we read about the table of showbread, the menorah, and the altar of incense, God says the door shuts. That's what God said. You see, and if the door shuts and you're not inside his house, it's devastation, absolute devastation, absolute devastation, because wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. God has a sacrifice. You see, because God says that this day that's coming, Israel is going to know him and the nations are going to know him. And this is the whole pattern. This is the whole setup. Right. God says, if you're under his feet, <laughs> Israel is going to know him first. And the nations are going to know him second. You see, this is why God doesn't change. God doesn't change. You see, this is the same pattern that we're going to see as we go through the text. And I'm going to show you the pre-tribulation rapture, this nugget. But I, want to, I want to piggyback on knowing God, right? We already talked about how the church, right, all the sheep, those of us who he's called by name, right, and he leads us out, hallelujah, because we hear his voice, amen, all of us who know his voice, we know him, right? God says this in John chapter 10, verse four, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. We know his voice. We know the voice of the good shepherd. We know the voice of the good shepherd. We as the body of Christ, we know the voice of the good shepherd. So on the day when God speaks, there's no fear because fear has to do with punishment. Fear has to do with torment, right? There's no fear on the day when God speaks, when he causes his glorious voice to be heard. On that day when God speaks, we are going to know his voice and the door is going to open. And God says in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. On the day when God causes his glorious voice to be heard, on the day when the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, that's his voice, with the voice of the archangel, Michael, going to stand up, war in heaven. And the trumpet of God, that's his voice. God says everybody who knows his voice, we are going to enter in through the open door and we are going to be saved, guaranteed. But for those who don't know him, Israel, for those who don't know him, the nations, well, they have to go through a time of trouble. And this is where the devastation comes into play. And we're going to look at Egypt. Right? We're going to look at Egypt to see this picture that God painted. Hallelujah. So let me bracket this so you can see this off top. Amen. Let me bracket this through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at this. Amen. This is all going to play into what we're going to go over with this pre-tribulation rapture. Amen. It's so beautiful. So I just did a word search of a phrase. Know that I am the Lord. Know that I am the Lord. Amen. You see it right here. Know that I am the Lord. This phrase appears 77 times in the Bible. Know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. 77. What a coinky dink, right? And so I want to paint this picture by showing you how this first lines up in the Bible. The first time that we come across this phrase, know that I am the Lord, 
It comes in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, where we read about this right here. This is when Moses is about to go back to Egypt in order to set the Hebrews free. Amen. And so what does God tell Moses? Amen. Let's get the context. Let's, let's begin at verse 1. God promises deliverance. Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh, who with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Hallelujah. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Look at this. Here it goes. First mention of this, of this phrase. Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So the first time this phrase is ever mentioned in all the Bible, know that I am the Lord, is mentioned in connection with Israel knowing that he is the Lord. Speaking of yod heh vav -Heh. hallelujah. Because why? Salvation is of the Jews, right? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So the Jew first, amen. And this is going to all tie in to the day of the Lord. But first, the rapture has to take place because we know God's voice, right? This is the church age. He's calling out a people unto himself, both Jew and Gentiles, the bride of Christ, right? And we are his sheep, and he's going to take us out of this world into his house, guaranteed because we know his voice. But for those who are left behind, well, what's going to happen? Amen. What's going to happen? Well, God says he's going to come riding on a cloud into Egypt, right? God says in the prophecies, hallelujah, that he's going to come riding on a cloud into Egypt. Amen. Isn't that Isaiah uh, chapter 19? Hallelujah. Verse 1, the burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Okay, so here's a prophecy that has yet to happen. Right. This is a prophecy that has yet to happen. God hasn't rolled on a swift cloud yet. Amen. He hasn't rolled on a swift cloud yet. We know that when the swift cloud comes, he's coming like lightning from east to west, revealed as the son of man with the golden crown on his head and the sharp sickle in his hand. And there's going to be a harvest. Revelation chapter 14. When the door to heaven opens, Revelation chapter four. We know this. Right. And God says it's going to be just like it was in Egypt. Right. Because Egypt is a type of the world. Hallelujah. Egypt is a type of the world. And on the day when God makes his entrance into his creation, when he makes his entrance, he's going to cause his glorious voice to be heard. Those of us who know his voice, we're going to be caught up in the swift cloud. Amen. In the twinkling of an eye. OK, that's the rapture. But for those who don't know his voice, what's going to happen? Well, the Jews are going to know his voice first. And we're going to see this now. Let me show you something else. Amen. The Jews are going to know his voice first for the for those who are left behind. Amen. According to this pattern that we're looking at in uh, this phrase, know that I am the Lord. Exodus chapter six, verse seven. God says that the Jews are going to know first. And then we go to Exodus chapter seven, verse five, which is the second mention of this phrase. And it's the Gentiles, specifically the Egyptians are going to know. Hallelujah. Look at this. Amen. Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh, verse 1, Exodus chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made you a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh shall not listen unto you, that I may lay my hand upon Egypt. And bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, 
out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Here it goes, verse 5. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Okay, so we have the pattern. Okay, this is, this is the beauty of God. You see, no matter where you go in the Bible, it's always the same story. Right. It's always the same story. That's why it's just so beautiful. It's just so amazing, right? To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Okay, so the Jew's going to know, the Jew is going to know first that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Amen. Because if you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father, the Father and Jesus are one. yod heh vav -Hey, behold the hand, behold the nail, right? Who was pierced in his hand with the nail? Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He's the visible image of the invisible God. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Hallelujah. Right? The triune God, all one. Amen. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. But all three are one. There's not three gods. There's only one God. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. But the Jews, they don't know that. <laughs> right? They don't know that. But on the day when Jesus Christ comes riding on a cloud swiftly into Egypt, on that day, the Jews are going to know first. But also, God says that the Gentiles are also going to know, represented by the Egyptians, right? Amen. The Egyptians are going to know secondly, right? First the Jews, then the Egyptians. First the Jews, then all the nations that are left behind, because we see the same pattern repeating in the prophets, right? So let's go down all the way to the bottom, okay? Because this phrase is only mentioned in six different books in the Old Testament. Nine times in Exodus, one time in Deuteronomy, two times in 1 Kings, uh, one time in Isaiah, 63 times in Ezekiel. And this is the whole point. 63 times know that I am the Lord is mentioned in Ezekiel. So Ezekiel has a lot to say about this. And this is what we're going to focus on. Amen. Because when we go to Ezekiel, we see the same pattern. I'm going to just take out two examples. I'm going to begin with Exodus, I mean, Ezekiel 37, verse 13. So this is all about the restoration of Israel, right? And there's so many different layers to what this is talking about. But before we go down this hole, I just want to stick to the main point, which is that the Jews are going to know him first, right? So Ezekiel 37, hallelujah, <laughs> Ezekiel 37 is the valley of dry bones, right? So Ezekiel sees all these dry bones and they all come back to life. Right, which is also a picture of the resurrection. But in uh, the immediate context, it's the restoration of Israel. Hallelujah. And so what happens? Hallelujah. Israel knows first. Amen. Ezekiel 37, verse 13. And you shall know that I am the Lord. There it goes. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Right. So the Jews know first. And so the second time is going to be the Gentiles, right? And that's what, exactly what we see. All right, we go back to the search. The next time we see it is in Ezekiel 38, verse 23. And you know what this is all about. This is all about Gog and Magog, right? And it's actually mentioned, let's see, uh, one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. It's actually mentioned five times in the Battle of Gog and Magog, right? So let's just go to the first time it's mentioned in the Battle of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel 38, verse 23, and here goes, the nations are going to know, right? On the day when God reveals himself on the clouds, because this is the context of it, right? This is when everything shakes. This is when the hailstones and the coals of fire rain down upon the planet, right? This is when God speaks, right? This is when everything that can be shaken is going to shake, hallelujah. And what does God end this chapter with? Ezekiel 38. The final verse of the chapter is verse 23, speaking about this judgment that comes upon Gog and Magog. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. I mean, you can't make it up even if you tried. Hallelujah. God doesn't change, right? We got the law of first mention at work, right? We got the law of first mention. And this is going to tie into this whole rapture that I'm going to show you in Exodus. Amen. In Exodus chapter 6, 
first time you ever come across this phrase, know that I'm, I am the Lord, the Jews are going to know first, right? Second time that we see this phrase, know that I am the Lord, God says the Egyptians are going to know that he is the Lord, right? So we, fat, we, we, we follow this pattern to the time of the end, hallelujah. And so we get to the book of Ezekiel, right? We get to the book of Ezekiel, which is what we're on the verge of right now. And the first mention, hallelujah, just going down to Ezekiel 37, Hallelujah. The first mention is that the Jews are going to know, right? The Jews are going to know first when he opens up the grave, which also speaks of the resurrection. It's a type and shadow of the resurrection, the rapture event. Another teaching for another day. Hallelujah. But the Jews are going to know first, right? And then the next time this phrase is mentioned, it's mentioned in connection with all the nations knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And it happens in connection with Gog and Magog which is the whole segue into the rapture. Hallelujah. This is the whole segue into the rapture because we see something interesting. Amen. We see something interesting because when we go back to Egypt, hallelujah, when we go back to Egypt, amen, we see many different types and shadows of the rapture. Amen. But I've never taught this type and shadow before until right now. And so picking up with the context, hallelujah, Picking up with the context of what is going on right here in Exodus chapter 6. We see that Moses and Aaron are about to go back and speak to Pharaoh, right? So this is before the plagues ever come. Because look at this, look at this beautiful picture. Before the plagues are, are, are ever come upon Egypt, right? We know that at the time of the end, hallelujah, in Isaiah chapter 19, when, behold, the Lord rides upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. We know when that day comes, right? When the swift cloud appears, right? When Jesus Christ comes like lightning from east to west, we know what must happen. We know that the rapture must happen, right? But if you're left behind, what's going to happen? And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. So if you're not caught up in the swift cloud, mm, if you're not caught up in the swift cloud when the door opens, mm, if you're not caught up in the glory cloud when Jesus Christ descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ rise first, and those of us who are alive and remain are caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If you're not caught up in the swift cloud, hallelujah, on that day, mm, are you a sheep? That's the question. Are you a sheep? Do you know his voice? Because everybody going to know him. Okay. <laughs> My goodness. Do you know the sweet song of the Lord? Amen. Mm. Uh, are you familiar with the song of Solomon? Mm. Do, do you know who's going to come leaping over the hills? Ooh, wait. Uh, right. Do, 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 do you know who, who's going to come in all of this splendor? Hallelujah. Uh, do you know why the glory cloud has to be spread before him? Do you know why he has to spread the cloud? Do you know? My goodness. Do you know why the cloud has to come on the day when the Son of Man is revealed? Have you spent time with him? Do you know? Do you know why he's riding on a swift cloud? Do you know? Mm. God says his sheep know. We know his voice right now. We've been born again. We have the spirit of God. Amen. We know his voice. Hallelujah. So when the swift cloud appears, everybody who knows his voice, we shall be saved. Guaranteed. Amen. When the swift cloud appears, everybody who knows his voice, John chapter 10, will be saved. When the door to heaven opens. Guaranteed. No doubt about it. Pre-tribulation rapture. 100% fact. No ands, ifs, buts about it. Okay. Now, how bad it gets before that? Hey, only God knows. Mm. How much trouble we have to go through before that event takes place? Only God knows, right? But we know that it's going to be pretty much business as usual as we know it today, right? Buying and selling, marrying and giving in marriage, right? Building and planting. Babylon, the great ruler, right? We know all these things are still going to be in place when the swift cloud comes. We know that. How bad the persecution breaks out against the body of Christ and all the world before that day comes? Only God knows. Right? But we know that it's going to be pretty much business as usual, just like it is today. Right? When the swift cloud appears, we know that. Right? 
But when the swift cloud appears and you don't know his name, well, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence. Everything shake that can be shaken. Shake! Right. Everything shake that can be shaken. Shake. Right. If you're not caught up in the swift cloud when he comes riding like lightning from east to west. Right. When God makes his glorious appearance on that day, utter devastation under his feet. Guaranteed. All the idols of Egypt move at God's presence. Right. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Okay. Right. And so here we see something interesting when we go back to Egypt in the days of Moses and Aaron. Hallelujah. We see a picture of the rapture, okay, in a different way that I've never taught before. So let's get to it, amen. So here we see the setup, right? Before Moses and Aaron goes to speak to Pharaoh, we see the rapture, amen. And we see it with the high priest, amen. We see it with the high priest because look at, look at this. Look where this appears. Right, because everything, every word, remember God's watching over his word to perform it, right? And so every word, where it's placed, every letter, every jot, every tittle, where it's placed is done for a reason, right? So we as Bereans can search to see if these things are so, so that we could understand God's game plan as he's announced it at the beginning, right? Because God doesn't change. He's going to declare unto us the end, amen? So here we see in Exodus chapter 6 an interesting note about the first high priest, right? And we see this interesting note about the first high priest right here in verse 23. Hallelujah. Moses is writing down the family lineages of the first three sons, of Reuben, of Simeon, and then of Levi. And so when he starts to trace the pedigree of Levi, he gets to verse 23 and he says this, Aaron took to himself Elishaba, daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon as wife, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Amen. Right. So this nugget appears before the plagues come upon Egypt. Now look at this, right? Because this is the rapture right here. We know that we have a greater high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. But Aaron, as the first high priest, is also a model. Right? Because look at this detail. Amen. Look at this detail. Look at the name of his wife, because this is the only time that this name appears in the Bible. Elishaba. Hallelujah. Let me take you to an article written about it. Elishaba. Here we go. Elishaba means God is an oath. God of oathing. God of seven. Hallelujah. The beautiful name Elishaba occurs only once in the Bible. Elishaba is the name of the wife of Aaron. Hallelujah. <laughs> and the name Elishaba means God is an oath, God of seven. My goodness, look at it. Hallelujah. The root word, Sheva, which in modern medieval times became pointed as Sheva, has to do with the number seven and the act of binding with an oath. An example with the proverbial seven seals or seven bonds. <laughs> so Elishaba. Eli is God, right? Shortened version of Elohim, El, hallelujah. Eli, God, and Sheva, seven, also God of oathing, hallelujah. God has made an oath because he is the God of seven, mm. right? God has made an oath to the seven, hallelujah. <laughs> God who cannot lie, he said, in my father's house, my goodness. You see, this is why, this is why it's so critical to study. My goodness, this is why it's so critical to study. Amen. This is why it's, it's so critical to go here a little and there a little. Right. To, to go line upon line, precept upon precept. If you want the gems, if you want the jewels, if you want the nuggets. Do you want some nuggets? Okay. You see, people don't want no nuggets. Okay, no wonder they out here hoodwinked, bamboozled, and led astray talking about the church is going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. The devil is a lie. You don't want no nuggets. All you want is a Big Mac with cheese. That's all you want. You don't want no nuggets. Okay. All you want is your Big Mac and cheese. Okay. But you don't want no nuggets. No wonder you out here looking 
dusted and disgusted talking about the bride going to be beat up in the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh, no, devil. You know you a lie. You know that. Okay, I'm going to get me some nuggets. By the grace and the mercy of God, I'm going to get me some nuggets now. Hallelujah. I'm going to get some gold, or some silver, and some precious stones by the mercy of Almighty God. I'm going to get it. Hallelujah. Because God has promised me and God can't lie. He's a rewarder of all those who diligently seek him. God says he has made an oath, Elisha. What's his oath? What's his, what, is, what is God's oath to the seven? Amen. Let, let's just go to one example, right? Let's, let's go to a famous oath, right? Let's go to a famous oath, right? And this is God making it, okay? Because Jesus Christ is God, hallelujah. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. People want to trouble us. They say, hey, you're going to be left behind in Jacob's trouble. You got to go through the time of famine. My goodness. Right. People want to trouble us. Hymenaeus and Philetus, they want to be a shipwrecker. Oh, no. I got an anchor of the soul. His name is Jesus Christ. Mm. Hymenaeus and Philetus, they want to be shipwreckers. And I say, hey, do you know the anchor? Hymenaeus and Philetus? I can't be moved. Ain't no trouble over here. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. I know the God of the oath. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know God of the seven. Amen. I know. Hallelujah. That God, he cannot lie. Amen. God told me this in John chapter 14. Here's his oath to the seven. Let not your heart be troubled. Mm. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. My goodness, you talk about an oath. Here it go, though. Here, 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 go, here, go to, here go to goodies. Verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Mm. Right? I will come again. When's he coming again? Isaiah chapter 19. The burden of Egypt, behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. Okay. What's going to happen on that day? What's going to happen on that day when the Lord rides upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt? Revelation in chapter 14. Okay. Here goes the son of man revealed on the clouds. Verse 14. And I looked and behold a white cloud. Hallelujah. And upon the cloud, one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out the temple, Michael, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Amen. First fruits, come up here. Amen. First fruits, come up here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let me show you things which must take place after this. Hallelujah. <laughs> First fruits, get up on in here. Table of showbread, menorah. Amen. <laughs> Dead in Christ rise first. Those of us who are alive and remain all caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Two wave loaves, baked with leaven, presented to the Lord. Hallelujah. As a wave offering. Do you know him? Mm. Two wave loaves baked with leaven offered up to God as a wave offering. Do you know them? <laughs> Two wave loaves baked with leaven offered up to God as a wave offering. First fruits, do you know them? Mm. Table of showbread, menorah, come up here. Let me show you things which must take place after this. What's going to happen? Well, well, what does God say? Well, what's the oath? Verse 3, John chapter 14, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. We're going to be there too, child of God. You see, here we see a beautiful picture. Hallelujah. Here we see a beautiful picture of the first high priest, Aaron, knowing that we have a greater high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, who's also going to take to himself a wife, the bride of Christ, the church, Elisha, God of the seven, hallelujah, before all of the plagues come upon Egypt, when the Lord rides upon a swift cloud and comes into Egypt, hallelujah. God is going to take, hallelujah, his bride, Elisha, because God has made an oath, he is the God of the seven, 
seven churches filled with the seven spirits of God. He has made an oath to his bride. Hallelujah. Be not troubled. Ain't no trouble coming to you. You're not going to be left behind in Jacob's trouble. The devil is a lie. When he comes riding upon a swift cloud, everybody who knows his voice because we're his sheep, we're going to be caught up in the swift cloud. Guaranteed. Amen. That's not all. Look at this. Look at these nuggets, though. <laughs> Look at these nuggets. You see, Aaron, as the first high priest, took to himself Elishaba, right? Again, Elishaba is God is an oath, God of oathing, God of seven. Hallelujah. So God, as our faithful high priest after the order of Melchizedek, is going to take, because he has made an oath, the seven churches out of this world. Amen. So that where he is, there we will be also. Amen. But look at this. Elisha, look where she, look, look, look what her pedigree is. You see, these are the, these are the quote unquote Easter eggs. Amen. You talk about, you talk about some, <laughs> you talk about some dipping sauce with your nuggets. Amen. Mm. Talk about some dipping sauce with your nuggets. Let's get a little dip on. Amen. <laughs> let's get, let's get a little dip on. Amen. Let's go, let's go a little bit deeper. Amen. Look at this. God says that Elisha, amen. Elisha, her father was Aminadab, right? Let's go back to the text. Aaron took to himself Elisha, daughter of Aminadab. Right? So who is Aminadab? Well, Aminadab means people of liberality. My kinsman is noble. Where does he come from? Let's see this. Best known is Aminadab, the son of Ram, of Judah and the father of Elisha, the wife of Aaron. Amen. So Abinadab comes from Judah. We see a, we see, you talk about an Easter egg. Amen. So not only do we have Levi, right? Aaron comes from Levi, right? The Aaronic priesthood, hallelujah, comes from Levi, Aaron being the first high priest. So now he takes to himself Elisha, who is from the tribe of Judah. Right? So here we have Levi and we have Judah. Levi is the priesthood. Judah is the kingship. Hallelujah. So now we have a merging together of the priesthood, Aaron, high priest, with Elisha, the kingly line, royalty, because Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah, we have the royal priesthood combined, right? <laughs> I mean, you can't make it up even if you try. You got the royal priesthood combined right here. Aaron, priesthood, Elisha, kingship, okay? Royal priesthood. Jesus Christ, who comes from Judah, whose priesthood is not of the Aaronic priesthood, but is from the order of Melchizedek fulfills, <laughs> hallelujah, the royal priesthood as our great high priest who also is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, right? He's not only our great high priest, but he's also the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's both king and priest and prophet, right? And the only begotten son of God because he is God. But here we see a beautiful picture of the merging of the royal priesthood when Aaron took to himself Elisha, who comes from Judah. Amen. And there's more I want to talk about, but I'm going to get to that in the next teaching, Lord willing, when we go over that board that I've been working on. That board that I've been working on, which uh, is going to be a good series about uh, the priesthood. Amen. There's more, to, there's more to say about that. But suffice it to say, you see this beautiful Easter egg, but that's not all. That's not all. Not only do we see a merging of the royal priesthood right here, hallelujah, because remember, we're talking about the rapture, amen, we're talking about the rapture in types and shadows, hallelujah, our faithful high priest, Jesus Christ, before he moves all the idols in Egypt, right, because when we get to Exodus chapter 7, right, that's when all the idols of Egypt are moved, so this is happening before it, here goes the rapture, this is when the swift cloud comes, type and shadow, our faithful high priest after the order of Melchizedek, hallelujah, is going to take to himself, because he's made an oath, the seven, he's going to take to himself Elisha, the bride of Christ, the seven churches, hallelujah. And we are his royal priesthood, 
Amen. Second Peter, first Peter, chapter two, verse nine. Right. A royal priesthood. We are the church. Hallelujah. But look at this, though. Look at this, though. Look at the look at even the details of these nuggets, because how many sons did they have? Right. Aaron took to himself Elisha, but daughter of Aminadab, sister of Nashon as wife. And she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Ooh -wee. <laughs> I mean, you can't make it up even if you tried. Amen. This is this is this is really this this is everything. Amen. Because well, what does God say about this day when the bridegroom comes? Ooh -wee. What does what does God say about this day when the bridegroom comes? Okay. God said, hey, 50-50. Mm. God says on the day, on the day, mm. Mm. at about midnight, 50-50. What you got? Mm. They say, what you got? You got any light on in your house? On the day when Jesus Christ comes riding on the cloud, swiftly in Egypt. You got any light on in your house? 50-50. Okay. <laughs> They say, you got, you got in the 50-50? Okay. Matthew 25. 50-50. Okay. Verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Okay. 50-50. Five wise, five foolish. Right. Who are the foolish? Nadab and Abihu. Right. Nadab and Abihu. Right. Nadab and Abihu, right? What they do? Okay. What they do? God said that they offered up strange fire. Right. They offered up strange fire in the presence of the Lord. Ooh okay. They 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 thought they had some light. Ooh mm. But God said, "Oh no! If the light that's in you be darkness, how great is that darkness?" God said, Nadab and Abihu. Okay. 50 50. Nadab and Abihu. Five foolish virgins. Okay. Nadab and Abihu. Offered up strange fire. Uh oh. God coming like lightning from east to west. Okay. Riding upon a swift cloud. Cloudy and dark day. Okay. You looking for the light now? Who got, some, who got the light now? Okay. Who got the light on? Okay. Who got the light on? Okay. And if you over there looking uh, a little Nadabby and Abahui, okay. If you over there looking like Nadab and Abahu, uh oh. On the day when Jesus Christ come like lightning, riding upon a swift cloud from east to west, and you over there looking like Nadab and Abahu, uh oh. God comes riding upon a swift cloud. Door to heaven open. Okay. Door to heaven open. God come like lightning from east to west. And he see you looking like Nadab and Abihu. Uh-oh. What's going to happen to Nadab and Abihu on the cloudy and dark day? Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. 50-50 which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Uh-oh. Got some strange fire in their vessels. They trying to do something unauthorized. They said, I don't need no oil. I don't need no Holy Spirit. I got strange fire. Okay. I don't need no Holy Spirit. I don't need no oil. I got strange fire, okay, 50-50. But the wise, hallelujah, but the wise, hallelujah, but the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamps. Amen. Hallelujah. Question is, do you got oil? <laughs> okay, do you got the 390 for the 390? Mm. You got the 390 for the 390? Ithamar and Eleazar, hallelujah. 390 is the Hebrew for Shemin in the Gematria. Right, this goes into the prophets, uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel. <laughs> prophecy of Ezekiel talks about the prophet having to lay down on his side for 390 days to fulfill the iniquity 
of Israel, right? That's the time that we're in right now. Type and shadow in the prophecies of Ezekiel, right? And how do we do that? We have to make the exchange. Ezekiel's laying on his side for 390 days to fulfill the iniquity. What you going to do? You're going to make the exchange? Because in the Hebrew, 390 is shemen. Sheen, mem, noon. Sheen, 300. Mem, 40. Noon, 50. 390. Oil. Right? Are you going to make the exchange? Okay, how do we make the exchange? We got to come to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We have to come to Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives the oil. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. When you come to Jesus Christ as a sinner in need of a savior, when you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, when you have repented and believed the gospel, amen, God says you shall be saved, and he seals you with the Holy Spirit, which is the oil, hallelujah, that's happening now, 390 for 390, right. Nadab and Abihu say, nope, I got a form of godliness, but I deny the power thereof. I got strange fire. Right? They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They said, you know what? I'm going to the 99 cent store. I'm going to do the discount. I'm going to do the discount. 390 for the 666. Mm. I'm going to do the discount. I'm going to the 99 cent store. I'm going to the 99 cent store. I'm going for a discount route. I'm going the discount route. I'm going to the 99 cent store. 390 for the 666. That's what I got, says the foolish virgins. Nadab and Abihu. I got strange fire. Okay. But for those who are, of us who know God's voice, because we're his sheep, we've done the exchange. 390 for the 390. Our iniquity has been placed upon the sinless Lamb of God. And because we believe in his death for our sin, his burial, and his resurrection, hallelujah, we are justified, just if I'd never sinned, right? Because in exchange, he gives us his life. He gives us the oil, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, the Holy Spirit, which is our seal unto the day of redemption. Amen. But on the day, okay, <laughs> just piggybacking up on this Ezekiel prophecy, there's going to come a day when Jesus Christ rides upon a cloud swiftly into Egypt, right? Everybody caught up in the cloud were saved, all the wise virgins, right? Eleazar, Ithamar, right? We're all caught up in the clouds, 50-50. <laughs> and at the same time, when that happens and you're not caught up, well, now Ezekiel, he's going to roll over. Ooh, roll over. Mm. Okay. Time to get a little dark. Ooh. Time to get a little toasty. Time, time, to put that, time to put the cheese in the oven. Ooh, time to put that cheese in the oven. Let's get a little melty around here. 40-40. Okay. We, 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 we gotta put some we gotta put some cheese on the grill. Gotta put some cheese on the grill. We gotta put some cheese on the grill. Okay. A little hot. Okay, what's God say? <laughs> Isaiah chapter 19. Right. And the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. Got to put that cheese on the grill. Got to put it on there now. We got to do the 40 for the 40. You know that. Got to do the 40 for the 40. You know that. Put that cheese on the grill. Okay. Put that cheese on the grill. Time to get a little melted. A little dark now. Mm. A little dark. Dark and cloudy day. Okay, 40 for the 40. Right. 40 has to do with testing. Right. 40 has to do with trial. Okay. 40 for the 40 is Jacob's trouble. Okay. So that Israel first can know that Jesus is Lord. And the nations will know. That Jesus is Lord, right? They have to go through the 40 for the 40. They didn't want the 390 for the 390, right? They didn't want the oil, right? They didn't want the oil when the oil was available, right? Matthew 25, it paints a pic perfect picture of this day, 
Hallelujah. Verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ riding upon the clouds swiftly into Egypt at that time, right? When the door to heaven opens. Verse 7, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Nadab and Abihu, foolish, said unto the wise, right? Eleazar and Ithamar, 50-50, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Oh, that 99 cent deal wasn't so good after all, was it? Mm. That 99 cent deal for the 666 wasn't so special after all, was it? Mm. You wanted to do the discount special. Look at you. Mm. You wanted to do the discount special. You wanted to cut some corners. Oh, wait. You wanted to cut some corners. You wanted to go up a different way. Oh, wait. Look at you. Mm. Isn't, isn't, this what, isn't this what the goats do? Right. Isn't this what the thieves and the robbers do? John chapter 10, verse 1, Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, <laughs> Nadab and Abihu, right. Nadab and Abihu, five foolish virgins, right. they wanted to go to the 99 cent store, right. they wanted to go to the 99 cent store, they said, hey, Let's go to the 99 cent store. Let's go from the south. Okay. Nadab and Abihu said, you know what? I don't think we should go to the south. Let's go to the west. Let's try to backdoor God. Okay. Let, let's try to backdoor God from the west. Oh, no. Nadab and Abihu said, you know what? Let's cover all the bases. because We don't, don't want to go east to west. Let's go from the north. Let's try to get, a, let's try to get over on God. Let's try to get over on God and come from the north. Let's go to the 99 cent store, get a discount, double check. Mm. Go to the 99 cent store, get us a discount, double check. You know we got that strange fire now. Mm. Know we got that strange fire. Who got that strange fire? Nadab and Abihu. You know, you know what Hymenetus and Philetus told us? Okay. They said, go over to that 99 cent store, get you some strange fire. Go ahead, Nadab and Abihu, said Hymenaeus and Philetus, remember? Ooh, wait. <laughs> okay. But on the day when it's the day of reckoning, right. <laughs> here comes Nadab and Abihu, right, <laughs> to me and you, Eleazar and Ithamar. <laughs> Nadab and Abihu. Coming over and say, hey, we need some of that oil now, that 99 cent stuff. Ooh, it's cheap. Mm. Okay. That 99 cent stuff. Ooh, it's cheap. And you know they was charging? They said we had some healing services. You know what I'm saying? They, 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 they was charging us for their healing services. They was charging us for them healing services from the north and from the south and from the west. They say, come over this way. For your healing services, it'd be 99 cents. They charged us, and we got this strange fire, but ain't no light on. Ain't no light on. We got this strange fire, and ain't no light on. And it's about midnight, bridegroom coming. Can you help us out? Okay. Nadab and Abihu, we told you, silver and gold, have we none? But such as we have, we gave it to you. And we told you to rise and walk. We didn't tell you to go buy and sell. Didn't say that. Oh, no. We didn't tell you to go buy and sell. We told you, rise and walk. Okay. We told you, rise and walk down the narrow road. But you said, well, you know what? I heard Hymenaeus and Philetus they got the 99 cent double check. 
So we had to double check. Mm. How many was in Fanita? They told us we had to go in double check for the double check. Okay. 99 cent. Okay. 99 cent got you that strange fire. Look at you. Okay. Look at you. Here, here, here you go. Okay. L- over there listening to Hymenaeus and Philetus. Right. Verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sail, and buy for yourselves. Okay. <laughs> now go ahead, Nadab and Abihu. We, 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 we getting caught up, okay? Quick, fast, and in a hurry. In the twinkling of an eye, got to go. See ya when I want to be ya. Okay. See ya? Because we got light. When I want to be ya. Oh, no, we ain't in darkness. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> and while they went to buy, okay, over there rushing back to Hymenaeus and Philetus, stumbling over themselves, hitting the deck, everything shaking. Okay. Nadab and Abihu, strange fire. Ooh, I told you. Time for the 40 for the 40. Okay. Time for the 40 for the 40. Look at you, ooh, a little melty. Okay. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Hallelujah. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Hallelujah. Door was shut. <laughs> Table of show, bread, menorah, altar of incense, all in. Door shut. Amen. <laughs> Verse 11, afterward came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Uh-oh. Lord, Lord, open to us. Uh-oh. Verse 12, but he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we see this beautiful picture. <laughs> God is so good. Exodus chapter 6, we see that our faithful high priest after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, represented right here in the story by Aaron, the first high priest, takes to himself Elishaba, right? God of the oath, God of seven, right? Hallelujah. Our faithful high priest, Jesus Christ, is going to take the seven churches. right? And even in that, Okay, God says to the seven churches, you better repent or else. Right? Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Laodicea. Right? He says, repent, 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 repent. Right? Thyatira, if you don't repent, I'm going to cast you into great tribulation. Right? Church of Sardis, if you don't repent, I'm going to come upon you like a thief. Right? Church of Laodicea, if you don't repent, I'm going to cast you out of my mouth. Right? Here we see even a hint, a type, and a shadow with the four sons of the 50-50. Nadab and Abihu died because they offered up strange fire, right? Foolish virgins. Eleazar and Ithamar represents the wise virgins. Hallelujah. But that's not all because look what goes on, right? I've been keep on telling you about this overall context of what we're speaking about. So what happens after the bride is safe? Hallelujah. What happens after the bride is safe? Because Aaron takes to himself Elishaba, and that's the last time you ever hear about Elisha, but she doesn't appear anymore in the scriptures. Okay, so that's representing the bride of Christ being brought out of this world into the Father's house, and we're protected from what's happening under God's feet, right? Because God is riding upon the clouds swiftly into Egypt. Rapture. Now under God's feet, and the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. That's what we read about when the plagues begin. Because now the plagues begin in Exodus chapter 7. Right? And look at this. This is, a little, this is a little, uh, uh, just a little brief synopsis real fast because we're going on an hour and 13 minutes. So rapture is taking place. And so now the idols of Egypt have to be moved at his presence. And the heart of Egypt has to melt in the midst of it. So how does... The tribulation begin. Well, what's the first thing? Satan cast down, right? Satan is going to be cast down. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 7. 
What happens? Verse 1, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. All right, so now we have a picture of the two witnesses. Hallelujah. We have a picture of the two witnesses, Moses and Aaron, two witnesses, and now they're on the earth, and what's happening? Hallelujah. Verse 2, You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people and the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Gog and Magog, you see the same language, remember? Gog and Magog, that's when the nations are going to know that God is the Lord, right? Because Gog and Magog happen simultaneously with the rapture for those who have been left behind. And the nations are going to know that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Verse 6, Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 years old, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Hallelujah. Generation 70 to 80 years. Here it begins, 80 years. Right? Aaron's 83. Hallelujah. Same time frame that we're in right now. Israel is 75. Hallelujah. May 14th, 1948. Plus 75, 2023. Here's the first event now. Two witnesses are here. Rapture has already taken place. Now what's going to happen? Satan's cast down, right? Aaron's miraculous rod representing Satan being cast down. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you saying, Show a miracle for yourselves that you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. Right. So the rod <laughs> that's cast down to the ground becomes a serpent, right? Verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Right? Type in shadow when you know the whole story. We see that Satan's cast down, first thing. Right? Satan is the serpent. He's cast down. This is further emphasized when we go to the prophets of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 10 talks about the rod that's in God's hand, the staff of his indignation, which is the Assyrian, because the serpent, which is cast down, hallelujah, is going to enter into the Antichrist, right? The Assyrian being the Antichrist. Right? Because the same word for rod that we read about in Exodus chapter 7 that Aaron cast down before Pharaoh, which becomes a serpent, representing the war in heaven and Satan being cast down to the earth. Hallelujah. First thing that happens for those left behind. Hallelujah. Here comes the dragon, right, to explain away the rapture, UFO, alien invasion, whatever he... He got up his sleeve. I don't want to see it. But here we see that this rod that he cast down, let's see the Hebrew for that word. Right? The Hebrew for that word is the same word that we get in Exodus, I mean in Isaiah chapter 10. Hebrew, hallelujah. Here goes the rod. Okay, the matah, hallelujah. The matah is a staff, a rod, a shaft, a branch, a tribe, matah. So he cast down the matah, hallelujah. Same thing that we read about in Isaiah chapter 10, where God is speaking about the staff that's in, his, that's in his hand for his indignation, which is the Assyrian. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, we see the matah, the staff that's in God's hands. Right. Matah. Okay. A staff, a rod, a shaft, a branch, a tribe. Matah. Right. So God says that the staff is in his hand. Right. And it's his indignation. And he's speaking about the Assyrian. Right who is a.k.a. the Antichrist, who's going to be filled with the serpent, right? The serpent gives him his power, his seat, and great authority, right? The dragon, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation, right? Because remember, God is sovereign. He's in control of everything, right? And so now he's going to use the Assyrian, right, who is going to be filled with the dragon, right? because he's been cast down, the serpent, and God's going to use that rod that's been cast down for his indignation, right? For the 40 for 40. Melty, melty. Okay. Melty, melty. Verse 6, Isaiah chapter 10, I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge. Okay, now it's the wrath of the Lord, right? The great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Six seal, right? 
God has indignation upon everybody left behind, right? Because all the light has been taken out of the world. He's going to use the serpent who's going to fill the Antichrist to accomplish his wrath upon everybody who's been left behind. It's the time of terrible judgment. You can't even imagine the terror. But God gives us a glimpse of it with this picture. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 6, speaking about the Antichrist, a.k.a. the Assyrian, the staff that's in his hand for his indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge, to take the spoil and to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Right? He's going to trample upon everything. God says in other places he's going to cast truth to the ground. He's going to practice and prosper. Right? He's going to make war with the saints right, and overcome them. Okay? It's, a, it's, it's just so terrible, it's unimaginable. Verse 7, Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. Okay? Okay, not a few. <laughs> okay? It's the rod in God's hand, his indignation. Okay? That rod that was cast down before Pharaoh that became a serpent. Exodus chapter 7, first event. Rapture's already taken place, right? Aaron took Elisha as his wife, okay? Mentioned before, the plagues have ever started in Egypt. Rapture, hallelujah. What a beautiful picture, hallelujah. Aaron takes Elisha as his wife before the plagues ever begin. And now the first event that happens when the plagues begin, serpent cast down, okay? Serpent cast down, hallelujah, okay? And what's gonna happen when the serpent's cast down? That rod, amen? God says it's in his hand for his indignation. Hallelujah. And here comes the Assyrian, rider on the white horse. First seal. Verse 8, Isaiah chapter 10. For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? Ten kings. Is not Calno as Kakimesh? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem of Samaria, shall I not? As I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols. That's where he's going. His, his heart, okay, because his heart is, according to God, to cut off nations, not a few. But the prize, right, is Jerusalem. Right? That's where he's headed. My goodness. That's where the Assyrian is headed. Jerusalem. Okay. The city of the great king. That's where he's going to make his final stand. Hallelujah. And God says he's going to be broken without hand. Hallelujah. But here we see a picture of it all happening before it happens. God tells us the end from the beginning. Verse 12. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem. Okay, Mount Zion is what? Heaven. Rapture first. And on Jerusalem. Hallelujah. What's Jerusalem? That's where everything's going to be centered at. That's where the second coming is going to happen at. Right? Because that's where the Antichrist is going to pitch his tent between the glorious sea. Right? What's going to happen? At the second coming, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. Okay. The stone cut out without hands is going to crush him. Hallelujah. Verse 13. For he saith, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. And there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. Right? No one's going to be able to stand against the Antichrist. Right? He's even going to be given power to overcome the two witnesses at the midpoint. Right? Who can make war with the Assyrian? Right? But little does he know... <laughs> He's going to be broken without hand. Amen. Because God explains it all right here in verse 15. Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Remember, the rod is in his hand. Right? The rod is in, is in God's hand. That's how he starts it all off. Verse 5, Isaiah chapter 10. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Right? God is in control. Same thing we see about it in Exodus chapter 7. Okay, Aaron cast down the rod that becomes a serpent, right? And then what does Aaron do, right? What does Aaron do, right? He takes back the rod by the tail, right? And it becomes a rod in his hand again. God is in control, right? 
He's in control of everything. But we see types and shadows of what's going to happen at the time of the end. Amen. And so back to Isaiah chapter 10, just to uh, wrap this up. God says this about this rod that's in his hand. Verse 15, shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it? As if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up? Or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood? Right? God is in complete control of the 40 for the 40. He's in complete control of the time of Jacob's trouble. This is God's story. No one else's. Verse 16. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. Right? His glory is kimosh. Right? And God says under his glory, God is going to light a fire. Right? A burning fire. Okay? Lake of fire forever. That's the glory of the Assyrian. Right? Filled with the dragon and everyone who follows them forever. Verse 17. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. Okay? They go to thorns, they go to briars. What did Jesus say on his way to the crucifixion? If they done this to a green tree, what shall be done to the dry? Mm. Right. If they done this to a green tree, what shall be done to the dry? Okay, it's going to be done to the dry, verse 18, and shall consume the glory of his forest, right? The glory of his forest is nothing but thorns and briars, right? This fire is going to consume all the glory of his forest. Everybody that takes the mark of the beast, 666, right? And of his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they shall be as when a standard bearer fainted. And the rest of the trees of his forest shall be few, that a child may write them, meaning zero. Right? All these trees of the forest that belong to him, right? A child's going to be able to write the amount of them left. Zero. Right? You see a child, they just take that crayon and start going around in a circular motion. Zero. None of them left. Hallelujah. Let me just jump down right here. Just to wrap this all up, and we'll get back to uh, Exodus chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod, and shall lift up his staff against you, after the manner of Egypt. There goes Egypt again, right? So same thing we're reading about here. It's going to be the same thing, right? That's why God begins... This whole end time judgment when he rides upon a cloud swiftly in the Egypt, right? And so everything is going to happen just like it happened again in the past, but only this time is going to be infinitely times worse. Verse 25, for yet a very little while and the indignation shall cease and mine anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb and his rod and as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. And, shall, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Hallelujah. So first event we see the dragon cast down, right? Type in shadow, Aaron cast down his rod, it becomes a serpent. What's the next thing? Right, first plague, the water becomes blood. This is the destruction of Babylon the Great, right? It's the same order, right? Because when Babylon the Great is destroyed, which happens at the same time of the rapture, which happens at the same time when the serpent is cast down, right? One third of all the sea is turned into blood, right? Revelation chapter 8, verse 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Hallelujah. This great mountain burning with fire is Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 25. That destroyed mountain burning with fire because a mountain is a kingdom. 
Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 25. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroyest all of the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon you and roll you down from the rocks and will make of you a burnt mountain. Right? This is destruction of Babylon. Babylon is destroyed. God says that one third of all the sea becomes blood. Right? So here we see God just being so beautiful in his word because everything is just so beautiful with him. The first plague, the waters become blood, right? Satan cast down Aaron's miraculous rod, right? But it's in his hand because God is in control. <laughs> Satan cast down, it's the rod of God's indignation. He's going to use it, right, to carry out his judgment upon all evildoers, right? And the next event, when the dragon is cast down, the water becomes blood. Babylon the Great destroyed, right? Hallelujah. And so we keep on going, but I'm already at an hour and 30 minutes. But as you can see, this is the word of God. Amen. This is the word of God, child of God. And I pray that God gave you the understanding because you have the anointing to see everything that he has declared at the beginning, which is the end. It's a beautiful picture. And I pray that you were blessed. Please keep me in your prayers. Please, please, please keep me in your prayers. I need them, child of God, and I pray for you, as I always pray for you, that God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus our Lord, according to his everlasting abundance of grace, mercy, truth, and love, and peace, and kindness, and everything that's good and perfect that comes down from him, the Father of lights. May he shower you as he has and as he will and as he's already doing, and may your heart cry be answered in accordance with his will. And I'm praying in total faith that you have already answered whatever heart cry that is that's in accordance with your will. And I'm thanking you in advance for all these wonderful, beautiful brothers and sisters of Christ that we're all growing together. We thank you, Lord, for all your spiritual blessings. And may we continue to walk by faith and not by sight, always with a hedge of protection around us, so that we can never be moved because there's nothing to fear and there's nothing to be afraid of because we fear you. The fear of the Lord is our treasure. Oh, how we love you. In the beautiful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray and ask it all. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen. PreachTheLoveOfGod.com Fresh drop. New bomber jackets in stock. But do you know what's really about to happen? We about to blast off because it's about to be the rapture when Jesus Christ, the lover of our souls, comes down from heaven and all the saints will be caught up to meet him in the air and we're going to be with him forever. But the question is, will you be part of the number when the saints go marching in? Well, that's up for you. You have to decide that. Repent and believe the gospel because Jesus Christ loves you. God bless you all. King Jesus, I'm thankful that the Lord led your feet here to sit down at the table and whet your appetite. May you come back next week if the Lord says the same. For more teachings of when the temple in heaven is open, everything will change. If you want further study, come to my YouTube page as you can see on the screen. And if you want to support the ministry, please go to PreachTheLoveOfGod.com to get all your merchandise to be a witness through fashion for the soon coming King, Jesus Christ. Rapture soon. Amen.